Good morning, and welcome to Crescent Heights Baptist Church. We're really excited that you're here this morning to join us as we gather together as the people of God to worship. Whether you're watching this in the sanctuary or at home, we pray and we hope that our time together will be meaningful, that you and I and all of us gathered together will worship God with everything we have. We will lay the burdens of the week down at his feet and just gather together as his people to proclaim that the kingdom has come and that the king's name is Jesus. Although the service is pre-recorded, if you do experience technical difficulties, by all means reach out to us. You can contact someone by texting 403-560-2688, and that should be on the screen uh, in front of you right now. And with that, let's turn our hearts and minds over to Jesus as we come before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in worship. At this time, Tracy is going to lead us in the call to worship. Good morning, my name is Tracy and today I'll be doing the call to worship, which is Psalm 138. Lord, I will praise you with all my heart, in front of those who think they are gods. I will sing praise to you. I will bow down facing your holy temple. I will praise your name because you are always loving and faithful. You have honored your holy word even more than your own fame. When I called out to you, you answered me. You made me strong and brave. Lord, may all the kings on earth praise you when they hear about what you have decided. Lord, may they sing about what you have done, because your glory is great. Though the Lord is high above all, he cares for the lowly. Though he is in heaven above, he sees them on earth below. Trouble is all around me, but you keep me alive. Re you reach out your hand to put a stop to the anger of my enemies. Lord, uh, with your powerful right hand, you saved me. Lord, I will show that I was right to trust you. Lord, your faithful love continues forever. You have done so much for us now, so don't stop now. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hand. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me,
My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that Please join with me as we uh, come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can still uh, worship you despite our distance, uh, that we can still pray to you, Lord, and that you hear us wherever we are. Thank you, Lord, um, for bringing us here to gather together um, online. Uh, and for those few who are in person, thank you uh, that you still um, have allowed us to meet this way. We know how important it is to meet together as your people. And so we ask that um, you would help us uh, to have wisdom in knowing how to meet with one another, how to encourage and uplift one another in these times um, where loneliness can be very rampant. Um, yeah, and where we often feel very isolated. Uh, Lord, we thank you for sustaining us through this year, through um, giving us strength in the day to day. Um, for helping us to adapt to the changes that have gone on around us. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you've made us, that we are adaptable. Um, and Lord, we thank you that we have you to help us and to strengthen us and to guide us into all wisdom and all knowledge um, on how to navigate these new situations. Uh, Lord, we pray over a congregation for those who are ill uh, and in hospital. We ask that your hand of healing would be upon them. Lord, we ask that your hand of peace would be upon them too. That you would be um, helping them to know and understand 
um, the situations that they are in, that they would also know that they are not alone, but that they have us um, uplifting them before your throne. Lord, may they know that you are with them, and may your Holy Spirit strengthen them as you teach them through these times. Um, Lord, we pray uh, for comfort for those who are grieving, that you would be um, quieting the souls of those who are in anguish and in grief, uh, that they would know that you have heard their cries, uh, and that you will answer in, in your time. May we have patience to wait for your time in these situations. And Lord, we pray for those who are out of work. Um, we ask that you be providing for them. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you do provide for us as you clothe the, uh, the flowers of the fields and as you feed the birds of the air who um, don't toil or labor, uh, but wait for you to feed them. Lord, we thank you that um, you feed us too, that you give us um, shelter and enough provisions to uh, see through the days. So, Lord, may we trust that you will provide these things, whether in the form of um, work and employment or... Um, if during our time of unemployment uh, you teach us new things the way that your church cares for um, those who are in need. Lord, for us who have means to give, uh, may we give faithfully. May we sense that uh, nudging and that urge in the direction that you are directing us to give, whether to a neighbor or a friend or a stranger or an organization. Um, may we be obedient in your call to be generous with all that you've given us, for everything is from your hand and all will go back to your hand. Lord, may you give us minds for the gospel and hearts for Christ. May you turn our hearts outward to see others, uh, to see the need around us, to not be afraid to go into communities that you are leading us into, um, no matter how uh, plain or how exciting they may seem. May we see each person as a soul uh, that needs you. Um, and for those who believe in Christ, Lord, may we see each person as a soul that still needs you, uh, to be uplifted and encouraged uh, in the faith that we share. So, Lord, um, we pray for your blessing over the sermon that uh, Tyler will soon lead us in. We ask that you be guiding his words, uh, give him wisdom and direction, and may your gospel be faithfully proclaimed uh, through his mouth as he shares. May this act of worship come before you as a fragrant offering, Lord, and we ask that um, as we serve you throughout this week, that this worship too would come before you as a fragrant offering. So search our hearts, Lord, test our anxious thoughts, see if there is any anxious way in us and any faulty way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. We pray these things by the power of your spirit in your son's mighty name. Amen. Hello Crescent Heights. It's nice to see you today. Whether you're in the sanctuary, at home, or listening in the park through your headphones, please join me today for the scripture reading from Philippians 1, 12 through 20. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former... Preach Christ out of selfish ambitions, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Beginning last week, today and tomorrow, uh, next week, we are examining the peace of God. I don't know about you, but this last year has not been one of peace. There's been many upheavals, and last week we looked at the peace of God uh, as partnership. Partnership where each individual, in this case, we're looking at the Philippian letter, and so Paul is the, the individual in that case, but you could put your name or my name, is partnered with the church as the body of Christ and Christ as head. Throughout his letter to the Philippians, Paul is very clear 
Uh, not necessarily in saying it specifically, but you just see it woven throughout the language that he is partnered with them for the sake of the gospel and the, the purpose of the gospel, the head of the gospel, the thing that's leading their mission is Christ. This week, we're going to look at peace as proclamation, a proclamation of that gospel. And for many of us, the idea of proclaiming the gospel doesn't bring us a lot of peace. It brings a lot of nerves. How do I communicate? Who do I communicate it to? In what context should I communicate those things? The idea, if I said to many of you, hey, next week you're going to preach, uh, the, you're going to proclaim the gospel from the stage for everybody to hear, many of you, I suspect, would run and hide. Many of you would have a heart attack and just think, I could never do that. And so what does it look like for the peace of God as proclamation? Again, in this letter, it's important to keep in mind that Paul is very clear that he is partnered with this church. He's part of the church and Christ is head. That rings true time and time again. His confidence in the gospel is unwavering. His focus is singular. And he is at peace despite his circumstances. You see, the occasion for this writing is uh, to his friends in, in Philippi, is his imprisonment in Rome. And not only his imprisonment, but his imprisonment that's being furthered by others who are proclaiming the gospel out of wrong motives. There's all sorts of circumstances surrounding Paul's, or all sorts of issues surrounding Paul's circumstance that is not one is, would not bring peace to you or to I. But for Paul, there just seems to be a confidence in where he's at, a confidence of what is to come, and an assurance that all will be okay. And I know in my life, especially over this last year, a confidence about things being resolved, an assurance that all would be okay, would really give me a sense of peace. And so let's look at what this proclamation of the gospel, this thing that Paul was desiring to go to Rome to do, and yet despite his circumstances, didn't find himself proclaiming the way he expected, why is it that we get, as he writes this letter to the Philippians, that he is a man who has at peace? And so as we start, let's imagine being in, his, in Paul's shoes. Let's imagine being in jail for our faith. We're bound up. The thing that we had desired to do is no longer possible because of the restrictions that's been placed upon us. We're restricted in where we could go and what we could do. To make matters worse, for him, there's those outside who are continuing to proclaim the gospel, but they're doing it out of motives that are actually keeping Paul imprisoned. They're trying to push him aside and keep him out of the way. How would you feel about that? How would you respond when you, the things that you want to do are restricted by external circumstances, when there's some authority that's over top of you keeping you from doing what it is you want to do? That seems a lot like how the last year has been. Sure, we're not imprisoned. Uh, those rights have not been taken away. But the way we would go about life, the things that we had anticipated in doing in 2020 and now 2021 uh, have been stripped away. It's not the same circumstance that we had expected. But in the midst of this, as we go about it, how has your peace been? How has your peace with God been? Have you felt at peace with God? Have you sent, had a sense of uh, peace in the circumstances that you find yourselves in? I know for me it's been an up and down battle. And so what can we learn about Paul in this proclamation? When I've had to learn how to video edit, when the technology hasn't worked, when I've wanted to just give someone a hug in, in consoling or coming alongside them and I haven't been able to do that, there's been a tension inside of me. And so what can we learn from Paul about when our circumstances change and how we're to respond and still live in and experience the peace of God. The first thing is this. Peace is possible when we realize that all circumstances are an opportunity for gospel ministry. Peace is possible when we realize that all circumstances are an opportunity for gospel ministry. Right now, wherever you find yourself is an opportunity for gospel ministry, to engage in the proclamation of the gospel. 
But what we have to work through is that the terms aren't always on our terms. The way we want to do things isn't always on our way. Sometimes we have to be challenged and stretched. We have to adjust to circumstances in order to fulfill the calling in which we have. When the mission of God is bigger than our own personal agenda or becomes our personal agenda, we realize that all circumstances are, are an opportunity to engage in gospel ministry. When we realize that despite coronavirus, despite uh, imprisonment in Paul's case, we have opportunity to still be followers of Jesus. You see, he writes this right at the beginning of the section Carla read for us. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, he's talking to the church in Philippi, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Even though I've been put in prison, even though people have arrested me and, and stopped me from doing what it is that I want to do, what I thought it was God was calling me to do, even though that's happened, it's served to advance the gospel ministry. What we hear Paul saying here is, I just let it go. I let go of the difficult circumstance. I let go of the injustice that may be upon me. I let go of the challenge before me because in spite of that, the ministry has continued to grow. As a result, it's been become clear, he goes on to say, that throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else, that the reason Paul is there is because of Jesus. His very existence proclaimed the call of Christ. And because of his chains, because of his imprisonment, most of the brothers and sisters, he says, have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel and without fear. What has actually happened to me, Paul says, has actually served to advance the gospel. And if we think about it, this is pretty true in our own life too. When we are celebrating things that are really dear to us, it really doesn't matter the circumstances where we're in, we can celebrate. When you hear of a triumphant story in the midst of adversity, we want to stand up and celebrate. It encourages us. When you hear the story of growth, we get excited. When a baby takes his first or her first steps, we all cheer, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. We celebrate kids graduating or getting their driver's license, their first words. We celebrate people overcoming injury or illness, despite our circumstances. And that is exactly what we see happening with Paul here. Despite being in prison, despite going to Rome under the context that he wasn't expecting, he celebrates because the work of the gospel, the very focus that he has is advancing. The people that he wanted to come and encourage are stepping up in faith and in boldness to proclaim the word that they know. In the face of good news stories, our troubles become a little less. We carry, the, the difficulties carry a little less sting. When the event that you hoped for, the person that you've been praying for, when that event happens or that person responds to your prayers or to the, the prayer that you have been praying, when the thing that you longed for comes to fruition, you celebrate. It doesn't matter what your circumstances is. You celebrate because good news is happening. Although our circumstances aren't exactly what Paul's were, the work that he was eager to do, I'm sorry, what I should say is, although the circumstances that Paul was encountering wasn't what he had expected or anticipated, the work that he came to do was being done by others' hands. And he dusted his hands off and he wrote to the Philippians and he said, look it, despite my circumstances, the gospel is being proclaimed. Isn't that amazing? Gordon Fee, who's a biblical commentator, he says, uh, to advance the gospel has been Paul's singular focus, his lifelong passion. And he's thus ordered his life, he's arranged his life so that nothing will hinder and everything will advance the message about Christ. It's remarkable how Paul reflects on his circumstance. Though he would surely prefer freedom himself to evangelize, he recognizes that God has used his curtailment to prod others into the ministry. They've stood up strong, and he rejoices as a result. Here is one for whom the gospel, Paul is one, 
for whom the gospel is bigger than his personal role in making it known. How is your life organized? How do you order your day-to-day? What are the things that are important deepest to you? If you're wondering where the peace of God is or why you're always angry or maybe envious, why you're bored or searching for meaning and purpose, maybe you're just checking things off the list to get them done, but there's no real end in sight as to when that list will be complete. If the idea of proclaiming the gospel in word and deed in any circumstance seems paralyzing to you or incredulous or unneeded, I would suggest that God is not done with you and wants you to work on some things in your life. Because peace is possible when we realize that all circumstances are an opportunity for gospel ministry. That no matter the circumstance, no matter the life stage that you find yourself in right now, when you and I are partnered together as the body of Christ and Jesus is the head of that, we are, and we are engaged in the ministry that he's called us to, we're doing the work that we were created for. When Adam and Eve were created in the garden, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Take care of creation. In effect, he could have said, just as he did through Jesus, make disciples. When we are engaged in that work of proclaiming the gospel, of making disciples, of training people in the ways of Jesus, although it may seem daunting right now, as we enable and work on that becoming our singular focus as it was for Paul's, for Paul, we will realize that no matter the circumstances, all oppor- everything creates opportunity for gospel ministry. The second point I want us to think about when we're talking about God's peace as proclamation is that peace is possible when we focus entirely on the love and the mission of God. As he continues his letter in verse 15, Paul writes, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. He had supporters in Rome. But the former, those who are doing it out of envy and rivalry, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, Paul acknowledges, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. It seemed people were actively proclaiming the gospel, engaged in ministry in a purpose to keep Paul in prison. And his response, what does that matter? The important thing, he says, is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, he says, he rejoices. Gordon Fee, a biblical scholar I referenced earlier, again, he says, these sentences together make it clear that Paul can distance himself personally from the pain that he is experiencing and those that are inflicting it on him. And despite their motivation, he can rejoice because the gospel is advancing. Evangelism is taking place in Rome as a direct result of his incarceration. Paul is focused on the mission of God, not on his own circumstance. He can see past the immediately, the immediate difficulty to the good news that is being shared. What about you and I? What about when we face adversity, when there's difficulty happening, where things aren't the way they want them to be, when we're actively or we feel like we're being persecuted? I want us to do a thought experiment right now, and this is a difficult one. So I I hope that we can journey with this together. Although for many of us, we can't imagine being in jail, uh, we we can kind of get a taste of things being locked down through COVID and, and the restrictions that are put on us. But here's an issue that I think will hit home for us. It will probably strike a nerve for many of us. In the last couple of months here in Alberta, two pastors uh, have been arrested for defying um, public health orders. And the question I want us to think about is how did you respond to that? Did you respond in sadness for the challenge that would be faced by their family, uh, their church, their close friends, knowing that their loved one was in jail? Did you respond in outrage? How could law enforcement arrest a pastor? That's insane. Did you respond in contempt? They got exactly what they deserved. 
Did you respond out of concern about how it might reflect on us, given that we're a church as well? But the question we really want to ask in examining this text is, how do you think Paul would have responded? Given his circumstances, given that we've, what we've just learned about him, how do you think Paul would respond to pastors being arrested for defying public health orders? What would have been his focus? When I read this letter to the Philippians, and particularly here in verses four, uh, 15 to 18, I think Paul would have asked, were they proclaiming the gospel? Were they being faithful to the ministry that Jesus has laid at all of our feet for those who call themselves followers of Christ? I think Paul would have first worried about or been concerned of, were they being faithful to proclaiming the gospel, whether they were doing it against public health orders or not? And for you and for me, that's actually quite challenging. I know I find it difficult because I want to focus on how they weren't conforming to the law, how they weren't being uh, respectful or loving and those other words that we would tend to use. But I think Paul would say, sure, maybe they wouldn't have done it the way you did, or maybe they did it in spite of how you would have done it. But were they proclaiming the gospel? Paul recognizes that there are people who have false motives, selfish desires, misplaced agendas. And I suspect that if he would have written to those he was referring to in Rome, the letter wouldn't look like the one he wrote to the Ephesians or to the uh, Philippians. It may have looked more like the one he wrote to the Corinthians, rebuking them for some of their actions and challenging them on some of the ways they behaved. But as he sits in jail for his faith, bound up, unable to do the thing he wanted to do, Paul's singular focus is entirely on the proclamation of the gospel. The people are coming to hear and to understand the love of God. He's excited about that people are coming to hear and understand the love of God as seen through the death and resurrection of Jesus. When we see a different approach and message, we see a different approach and message when addressing those teaching the false gospel. When he writes to the Galatians, it's a whole other attitude that Paul gives. He calls them all sorts of horrible names because they're twisting the gospel and adding to the gospel. But here as he sits in prison, the people that are doing things against him, he has no concern because they're preaching the gospel and people are coming to know Jesus. As he writes to his friends, Paul focuses on the love and the mission of God. What about you? Where is your focus? What catches your attention and keeps you, keeps, your, uh, keeps you fixated on it? Is it the gospel? Is it God's mission? Is it his love for you and for your neighbor? If your first response to other Christians going to jail is, let's go get them, or they're a bunch of idiots, or I hope they go to jail, and your response is not, are they true to the gospel and are people coming to know Jesus as a result of their ministry? If, that's, if our response is to point fingers first and then to be concerned about whether they actually love Jesus and are proclaiming his ministry, engaged in his ministry, second, I would suggest that you or I may need an adjustment in our focus, especially when we find the peace of God elusive. If we find that we're not in peace, maybe it's because our focus isn't on the proclamation of the gospel. Maybe we're missing out on being singularly focused on the love and the mission of God. Thirdly, finally, peace is possible, we see here in Paul's letter, when we live in the hope of God's faithfulness to his promise. He says, continuing on in, in the second half of verse 18 into 20, he says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and I hope and, that, uh, and, and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Not only was Paul immediately focused on the mission of God 
and the work of Christ in, through the proclamation of the gospel, his future hope was grounded in God's faithfulness to complete the work that he had begun. He was, his faith and his hope was grounded in the, hope, in the um, promise of God to restore all things, which would be what was being realized in his partnership with the Philippians with Christ as head. Is what he was realizing and experiencing through their prayers for him and the work of the Spirit which would deliver him. As we will read next week, as we continue on in this passage, Paul goes on to say that no matter whether he lives or he dies, it's going to be a good outcome. No matter whether he faces the death, death sentence or he's released from prison, it's going to be a good outcome, he will go on to say, because he's incredibly confident that God would do as he said he's done, that the work that he has begun would one day be brought to completion. He wasn't trying to escape from life any more than he was trying to live at all costs. Paul was content no matter the circumstances. In fact, he had begun and he was living out seeing the big picture of God. And as he concludes this letter, he says such, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances, he would go on to say. I know that what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every circumstance. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this through him who strengthens me. Paul was absolutely confident in God's faithfulness he lived in the hope of God's faithfulness to fulfill his promise. He lived in the present moment fully aware that he was responsible for all of his actions and all of his words. But he also realized that any of those actions and any of those words could neither add to nor take away from the love of God, which was poured out through Jesus Christ. This is good news. Because of the eternal love of God, has been poured out in Jesus through his death and resurrection. Paul and all of us who believe in him as Savior and Lord are free to live as though the kingdom has come on earth as it is in heaven. God is faithful to his promise and he will one day complete the work that he has begun in you and in me and in all of creation to restore it. The first part of experiencing the peace of God is to live in partnership with Christ and his body, the church. The second part is to proclaim that message, to live it out, the message of the gospel day by day, moment by moment, which is not easy. And we're going to address that in part three as we look at the peace of God as perseverance. But for now, as one's called to proclaim the gospel, we will find peace when we proclaim as we realize that all circumstances are an opportunity for ministry. When we realize and focus on the entirety, or we, when we focus entirely on the love of God and his mission for us, we will find peace through proclamation when we live in the hope of God's faithfulness to his promise. As he said in the beginning part of his letter, which we read last week, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And when we live that out each moment of every day, we will find confidence to proclaim the gospel. And in that confidence and in that proclamation, we will know that we are doing the work God has called us to. And in so doing, we will find peace. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have called us to engage in your mission to proclaim the kingdom of God, to proclaim that Jesus, you are God's son, and through your death and resurrection, we might find hope eternally. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to be challenged by the call to make disciples wherever we go, and that as we grow in full confidence that you have called us to do this, and as we practice it moment by moment, day by day, that your peace would infuse us and surround us and continue to build upon the work that you are already doing. And that we would, like Paul, know that no matter the circumstances, we can be content for you are at work in us and through us to make the kingdom known. Amen.
Please join together as the worship team, lead, worship team leads us in one final song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, At this time, let's pause and give thanks for all that God has given us as we make an offering to him as an act of worship. Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We pray now that as we give uh, to the work of your ministry here through Crescent Heights, that we would give with generous hearts, with joyful hearts, uh, in, in anticipation of all that you will do. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon this offering. May be it multiplied as need fit for everything you have called us to do, that we might be faithful uh, and that we might be good stewards of the resources you have given us. We praise you, Father, for your gift of life to us and for the opportunity to work together for your mission. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again for joining together as the people of God to worship him. Just a few announcements before we conclude. Uh, kids ministry is continuing at 1 o'clock this afternoon via Zoom. Prayer ministry is ongoing on Tuesday nights at 7.30 via Zoom as well as Sunday mornings 9.45 here in the building or 9.30 on Zoom. Friday afternoons, youth ministry continues as we gather here in the sanctuary or through Zoom. Uh, again, all the information for all of these things is online. We encourage you to go to the website, check the Facebook page for more information. Ladies Bible study continues in person here in the sanctuary at 6.30. 
uh, contact Lisa Goodwin if you do have more, inf more questions about how you can get involved. That is all we have for today. We thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Go with the blessing of God. You are his people to proclaim that the kingdom has come and that the king's name is Jesus.